Well, good morning. good morning. It is good to be gathered together to worship the Lord. We welcome you, and good to know that uh, we're in the right direction, headed to the headed to the good land that the Lord has promised us. Yes. He's gone to prepare a place for us, and He will come again. And so we rejoice in that. Amen. Uh, it is good to see you. If you're visiting, we're glad to have you this morning. I do want to um, uh, invite our choir, if you want to just take a seat just for a moment. I want to invite our deacons, if you would, to come up at this time. We've got a little uh, presentation we want to give to, uh, to a brother who's been dear to us that has, uh, has uh, encouraged this faith family through a time of transition. Um, as Pastor Frank has retired, and our, our brother, Pastor Carl, uh, came in as the interim. So, Pastor Carl, if you would uh, come on up here as well. We just want to, as a church, uh, thank you. What will Mr. Bob get here? Uh, yeah, <laughs> Pastor Carl, we know. It's a surprise. <clears throat> We just we just want to take some time on behalf of the church to thank you. Uh, we've been we've been praying about what we could do to uh, just express our thanks as a faith family. So on behalf of Bethlehem, uh, the leadership here, the deacons, myself, we just want to present you with a uh, an offering and also a gift to the Whitestone Inn up in Paint Rock for you and your wife. And uh, you can go at any time; it's all in there, so you can schedule that whatever's convenient to you. But we want you to know we love you. We appreciate what you've meant to the church in loving and teaching God's word and uh, and just uh, loving the people. Amen. Are you appreciative for Pastor Carl? Yes. Pastor Carl is a uh, he's a good brother. A good pastor and uh, been faithful to the Lord over the years. Yes, sir, you can. You jump in church. You've already been overwhelmingly so good to me and my family. And many of you, I want to thank you, but I couldn't help but take one minute to say I love you. I thank you. And most of all, I give all the glory and the honor to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm proud. Thank you. Brother, brother's dad, and we've been looking for this. So I love you. I love you. I love you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And he's one of the only pastors I know that can uh, play the guitar and bass as well. So uh, we're thankful for that. Thankful to have Pastor he Carl, in and he can <laughs> sing as well. And so he has set the bar really high because I can't play a guitar. <laughs> I definitely can't sing that well, but uh, we're thankful for him. Well, if you have your Bibles, turn with me real quick to the book of Philippians. I'm just going to read our passage of scripture this morning, and then we're going to continue to worship as uh, Jerry and the choir leads us in a time of singing together and worship to the Lord. I'm just going to read verses 1 to 8. This is the word of the Lord. I invite you to stand. Y'all stand with me as we honor the reading of God's word. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi, with the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, Always in every prayer of mine for you all making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart. For you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and the confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. Amen. May the Lord bless his word to our hearts. Join me in prayer. God, we thank you. And we praise you, Lord, for your good grace. We thank you, Lord, that it is you who have begun a good work in us, and you will see it to its completion, Father. And we know it will be by your spirit and through uh through the power of your word, Lord, that you continue to change us and make us like Jesus. 
Father, we do give you thanks, Lord, for um, for Pastor Carl and for his investment here at Bethlehem. We pray that you would bless him and his precious wife and just continue to use them, Lord, as they minister here amongst uh, us and, and around the county, Lord, as he goes and encourages his grandson and has invested so much in so many lives, Lord. So we thank you for him. We thank you now, Lord, that we get to worship you. We get to praise you for who you are and what you've done. You are the good creator, as we have been reminded in Sunday school. And Father, you had a grand plan through your son, and you have redeemed us. You have made us uh, holy in your eyes because of Jesus. And so, Lord, may we sing to you. May we sing to you based on what you have done, Lord, and bring us back into a good relationship through the perfect life, death, resurrection, and ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ. So Father, be honored, be, be glorified. May you be adored by your people as we sing to you. And we pray this in the mighty name of Jesus and all God's people said, Amen. 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 Amen.
and shake hands one with another. These, that's all there, and then this one here. First ones I remember singing on here was a very late. I'll wait, let's make them sing. I know some of y'all already gave. Let's stand and uh, hum a song or play a tune, play, play an instrumental or something. Here, uh, we get some ushers to come forward. We'll take our offering up. We'll pray here just before we do our offering. Just to ask God to bless the offering. Thank you for your visitors for being here today, and uh, we love you. Come back and be with us. Make yourself open to God's will. If you've visited here a few times, 
and you feel God's spirit moving in your heart, that this be a good place for you and your family, we'd invite you to talk to Zad and uh, pray about joining this place. We need workers. We need people to further the gospel. So let's pray. God help us as we worship you today in our giving. Thank you for the opportunity to give. We know God, many people around the world yes. would love to participate in giving, but don't have the means. You've blessed us in America so much. Help us to give to you and worship and sacrifice today out of the love that we have for you. Yes. Be with our dear pastor Zad today as he brings the message. Fill him with your Holy Spirit. Help his recall to be. God, have you yes, the words you'd have yes, us to hear. Sir. Help us to act and receive his words gladly. Yes, sir. We thank you for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.
servants, Lord, who you have made holy in your eyes, and Father, that you, Lord, you, Lord, would work through us, that we, as a church, as a body of believers here, would come together, Lord, and recognize that we can do a whole lot more together than we can apart, Lord, that we need your spirit to bind us up, and Lord, to keep us focused on the mission, Lord, of loving you with all our heart and making you known here in this in this community, in this county, in this state, the nation, to the nations, Lord. What a great task, Lord, you've given us. But Father, we confess we got hurts. We have, we have trials that we're going through. Lord, many of us in here this morning just talking with people, Father. We've lost loved ones. We have loved ones that will be with you soon, Lord, and our hearts are heavy. We grieve. We mourn. We're, we're missing them. We're going to miss them. But Father, you know, we know, Lord, that your purposes and your promises hold true. Yes, amen. Lord, that you'll never leave us or forsake us, that you'll strengthen us, that you'll walk through us, with us in this life, Lord, for your glory and for our good. And so, Lord, we need you. We need you more now than we ever have, Lord. May that be our heart's beat and desire each day to recognize our great need of you and you alone. And Father, that we would encourage one another. Lord, help us as we spend time with you and look at you long in your word. That Father, the way we view one another as brothers and sisters in Christ, that our love and affection would grow as a result for our love and affection of, of you. And so God, thank you. Thank you for this precious time that we've had already to, yeah. to, to be together, to be gathered together as the body of Christ, Lord. Yes. And so, Lord, now as we come to hear from your word, Lord, your word is truth. Yes. Your word is perfect in all its ways. It is sufficient yes. for all that we need in holiness and godliness. Yes. It's your word we need, Lord, to come and to penetrate our old hard hearts. To continue to make us who you want us to be. So give us a heart that beats like your son, Jesus. Give us a heart that beats for your glory, for the good of your people. And so, Father, we pray. We pray that if there's anyone here this morning that is visiting, that doesn't know you, that they would come to know you. 
Lord, I pray if there's any here that are members of the church that are indeed lost, that, Father, you would awaken their hearts and eyes to see your grace in Christ. And, Father, you would supernaturally save them by the work of your spirit. And, Father, we rejoice. We're going to rejoice always for you are good. You are on your throne. And, you, and your ways will, your purposes will come to pass, Lord. So we thank you. We praise you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 If you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn with me to the book of Philippians, chapter 1, 3 through 8. And as you're turning there, I want to go over a couple important uh, prayer needs and announcements that we can be lifting up. Uh, one is Miss Judy Watson. Um, Miss Judy will have surgery tomorrow morning at UT Hospital at 9 30 uh, for breast cancer. So we want to pray for her. I um, want you to be praying for her. And, and Robbie and will be there tomorrow. She'll have to be there, I believe, at 6 30. And um, she'll do all the pre op, and this surgery is scheduled for 9 30. So pray for her and her, mark, her mind and her heart uh, that the Lord would sustain her and encourage her as she, um, she prepares for that. Uh, continue to pray for uh, Miss Willa Harris, who her sister B, I shared, uh, and during Sunday school passed away. So pray for Miss B. They'll have services tomorrow at Byerly Hale from 5 to 7. Is that right? Funeral at 7? Okay. 6 to 7. I'm sorry. 6 to 7. So um, keep them in your prayers. Um, also, just uh, for Vacation Bible School, again, pray for this week. Um, some of you know, some of you were saved when you were at Vacation Bible School when you were a little kid. Um, it's an important week in the life of little kids and even as adults as we spend time together and growing um, and serving and hearing God's word. You pray for this time. These are things that we can do together as a body. And Thursday will be the ending of Vacation Bible School. And so um, we'll go directly to our classes on that Thursday evening. And so that's a little bit of a change, I believe, Miss Laura was telling me. Um, and then also after the service, I was going to share in the message because it, it really ties in well. But uh, Miss, Miss Kathy Richardson, the Lord has placed a ministry on her heart for the body of Christ here, um, which is it, it entails a serving of those that are going through surgeries or those are coming in or out of the hospital um, uh, and, and prepare meals for those families. And it's a great ministry to minister to those families. Uh, when you come home, you're kind of overwhelmed. Um, or if you've lost a loved one, it's a uh, it's a tough time. So she wants to have a meeting uh, right after the after this service. Her and Aaron and um, Aaron had posted some stuff on Facebook as well, just outlining that. Uh, but if you're interested in being a part of that um, and preparing some meals uh, for bereavement and different issues like that, uh, just stay and just meet right up front. Is that okay, Miss Kathy? Just meet right up front here and um, and share. So. Thank you for that. Thank you for your heart for that as well. Amen. I think, um, oh, and, and one good update. So uh, uh, Trey and Randy and the guys that are there in Guatemala, the Lord is going well. Uh, the, the Lord is moving well. There's been six uh, folks that have trusted the Lord. And today I believe they're going to make extension of the body of Christ here uh, locally, but universally as well. There's other churches represented. So. Praise the Lord for that. We look forward um, to getting them back home. They'll be back home Tuesday night late. They'll get in around midnight or so. I think it's scheduled for 10, but um, Greg said it normally gets in. And Greg Watson says it gets in about about 12. So uh, just pray for them as they travel back. I know they'll uh, they'll be ready to get home to their family. They're ready to get them home as well. Philippians chapter 1, 3 through 8. This, uh, this week in this study, it's been a busy week for me. Uh, been a little bit of an emotional week as well. Um, I know I shared uh, in Sunday school just going down and being able to spend some time with uh, uh, my father-in-law and Tori's, uh, Tori's dad, Fuzzy. Thank you for praying for him. Um, unless the Lord intervenes, uh, he'll get to see his king soon. And um, it was a good time together. But it brought up a lot of memories, you know. Um, it brings up memories with him. It brings up memories of the freshness of my mom going home to be with Jesus in March. I begin to think about uh, the church, uh, you guys, uh, many of you who've lost loved ones this year, this past year. Um, many of you here very recent, uh, husbands, um, uh, brother-in-laws, moms, dads. It's a, it's a 
It's a tough transition. And many times, and I want to be careful of that, is to not to give the impression that emotions are bad. Emotions are not bad. But our emotions must be governed by God's word and his spirit. Yes. Yeah. Is it wrong to cry? Is it wrong to be emotional and cry? Absolutely not. But we need to allow the, God's word and his spirit to govern us and to steer. Because our emotions can just lead us into despair. It can lead us into a time of discouragement. And as I begin to reflect upon this passage, and I hope you've got to read it this week, is that I see a, a, a man in the Apostle Paul whose emotions and his heart and his life was so governed by Jesus that he didn't think of himself and what he was even facing and the hardships that he was under and in. But he thought about this church, that old song, Precious Memories. Paul begins to, to, begins to reminisce about the partnership, the fellowship of these Philippian believers and what they've meant to him throughout his life and through his imprisonment. Yes. I'm just flooded with emotions of people who have invested in my life. And I want you to think for a moment, if you're a believer this morning, and if you're not a believer this morning, think with me as well of the people who have been pointing you and encouraging you to be to where you're at right now. Amen. People who pointed you to Christ. Maybe someone's invited you to come. I said, man, come. Come worship Jesus. Come follow Jesus. Right? I think of my mom. I think of the investment she has made. Think about the sacrifices she has made. Think about Fuzzy and the good times over the past 20 plus years with him. A simple man, quiet man, drove an old Ford pickup truck, a red, he had something for Roar, a red Ford pickup truck. I met him, he had one, it died, he got one in 97, and they just sold it. <laughs> Still would run. He invested in relationships. Relationships is, what's mat is, is what matters the most. Yes. We can have a whole lot of theological understanding and be able to pronounce things correctly in here, in God's Word, and be able to look like we have it all together on the outside. But insides, our hearts are far from the yeah, Lord. Yeah, yeah. Paul was captivated by Jesus. This morning's message, we see the Apostle Paul share an incredibly loving uh, introduction and thanksgiving to God for the lives of these believers at the Church of Philippi. And these people had committed, they had partnered, and they had given themselves to the advancement of the gospel. To see the gospel go forth through Paul. They were his hands and his feet. Now from chapter 1, verse 3, all the way through verse 26, the main point is this. It's keeping the good news of Jesus, the gospel of Jesus, at the center of everything. What is at the center of your life? You know how to tell where you spend your time and your money. You just break it down. Look at your bank account. Look at your checkbook. Where are you investing your time? Is it investing in relationships? And I'm not talking about being here at the church all the time. Okay. Is church attendance good? Yes. But you can give good church attendance and not be investing in relationships in any way outside of just coming and sitting. Right? No, it's investing and what matters the most in disciple making relationships. Number one, investing in the relationship that has been invested in you, and that's yes. with the Lord Jesus. Amen. And then in others. Keeping the good news of Jesus centered. Paul did this. He was a gospel centered, a Christ centered man. He was Christocentric in everything he did. Paul would say, Follow Jesus. Or follow me as I follow Christ. Imitate me as I follow Jesus. So the main point this morning in our text, in verses 3 to 8, that's as far as we're going, four points, is gospel par partnership should be at the center of our relationships. It should be at the, the center of our relationships as brothers and sisters in Christ. So a question for us this morning is what happens 
when indeed the good news, the good news that Jesus has come and not just died. That's good news, right? But Jesus came and lived. He lived what? A righteous life. The perfection that was needed to satisfy the demands of a holy God Amen. was lived out by God in the person of Jesus. Yes. Jesus is God. See, he lived a sinless life. He never had a bad attitude. He never bit nobody in the nursery. Yeah. Never got mad over that lollipop as a little kid. Yeah. Never sassed back to his mom and his daddy. No, he was focused. He was, he was sinless. He was perfect. Yes. He always saw people with the eyes of compassion. Yeah. I was praying yesterday, coming on from the yeah. airport. Everything was good, man. I got Savannah. And started started blowing up far as the weather thundering and lightning i was like lord please get me home you know <laughs> i want to get back to church you know it's good you know things are good i'm just i'm sharing this a little bit i want to talk about myself but just talk about how quickly our attitudes and our thinking when things don't go our way can get <laughs> redirected real quick well we got delayed and we got delayed and we got delayed and then finally we get to atlanta and uh, my the, the next flight, connected flight from Atlanta to Knoxville was uh, was at 8:55. We landed at like 8:24, 8:25. I was at the T terminal in Atlanta Airport. If any of you flown through there, and I was going to the D terminal, which was almost as far as you could go to the other side of Atlanta Airport. And so I was like, "Bless God, I'm gonna have to run." So I find do make it. Praise the Lord. I'm sweating and nasty. And, uh, you know, out of shape, I'm running to the airport like a fool because uh, I didn't want to make it 11. I knew I'd be gassed, so I was trying to make it. I made it. But as I, I got on the board of the plane, I didn't have a seat. And I, I looked on there, and I was like, oh, this is perfect. It's like, you know, I don't have a seat. They're probably already, they had already moved me to a different flight, and, and airlines will do that. So if you're flying, just, hey, this won't cost you nothing extra. Okay, this wasn't in my preparation in my notes, but... Um, if, if you use a little app on your phone and they move you to another uh, um, flight, you can still go to that one you're booked on. They just don't think you're going to make it, right? They wasn't counting on this big South Georgia boy running fast through the airport, right? But I got there and, and I was upset. I was like, man, mercy, you know, everything's getting delayed, this and that. And uh, as I got on, just this overwhelming, it was the Lord. He was like, hey, man, it's going to be all right. Just calm down and don't forget to see people. Don't forget to see people. I sat down by a brother. He's a medic uh, with the Navy, um, flying back. His name is Isaiah. His daddy, Frederick, is dealing with cancer. And I wanted to get in that seat, sweaty as I was, put my headphones in and listen to the scriptures. Be read, and a sermon that I had pulled up. But the Lord kept saying, you need to see people. I was able to talk with Isaiah and uh, hear that I believe he is a believer and pray with him for his dad. How, how quickly we get distracted. How quickly when things don't go our way, we are turned another direction. Yeah. The Apostle Paul is focused. What you see is that uh, the gospel is center in his life. He serves for us as an example, even though that's not the main point of this text. It is an application from the text. Because he's following Jesus. So what happens when the gospel is at the center of our relationships? What is at the center of your relationship with your husband, with your kids, with your loved ones, with your neighbors, with your coworkers? What's at the center? Yes, in jobs, you got a job, you got a task to do. But God has placed each of you in specific areas to be used to spread the good news and to make disciples. You're there purposefully. Right? God has you there. So number one, from our text, what you'll see when the gospel at the center of our relationship is you will experience thankfulness to God and, and joy. A deep-seated joy in our hearts. Look at what God's word says. Paul says, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. Always in every prayer of mine for you all making my prayer with joy. You see a thankfulness. 
It's real easy, to, though, to, to look at this text and look at verse 3 and jump to what automatically comes to your mind. What is he thankful for? The people. No, it's personal. Paul says, I thank my God. How often do you thank your God? How often do you thank the Lord Jesus Christ for who he is and what he has accomplished? These memories of faithfulness flood Paul's memory. He's remembered how committed the church has been since his imprisonment, him and Silas, right? Since then to now, where he's in Rome in prison, chained to another uh, Roman soldier, pin him down. He says, share that. He focuses on how committed they are, committed to gospel ministry. See, Paul had joy in spite of his circumstances and how fickle we are. Our faith is so fickle. When things don't go our way or we're hurt, we're so easy to take our focus off the commander in chief, the author and the perfecter of our faith because we're sinful people. And so he says, I thank my God and all my remembrance of you always in every prayer of mine for you all making my prayer with joy, with joy. There's three aspects of prayer are combined here. You have intercession where he's praying for others. You have thanksgiving and you have joy. And they're all focused upon the Philippians. Except I think my God. Paul acknowledges that the gift has actually come from God through them. Yeah. Right? God has used these believers to be a blessing to him. So I think my God. The, the believers here at, at Philippi have been the channel, have been the conduit, right? We all know what conduit is. You build a, you build a house, you build a, a building, metal buildings in particular, you have to run conduit, and you stick that wire, through, that electrical wire through there. It's purposeful so that that wire can go through and you can hook up the, the outlets so that things can function. The church there at Philippi, weak, persecuted, not super wealthy, are the conduit in which God is using for gospel going to Europe. Think about that. Yeah. Yes. Amen. The gospel's in Guatemala now before two has been sent out. Mm -hmm. Two other brothers there as well. Yeah. Preaching the good news and God is saving young people. And maybe old people. I haven't got all the ages. They're the conduit. So the primary focus here in verse three is God. Using those believers and Paul is thankful for that. They were kind to share in his trouble. Look at uh, chapter 4. Flip over to chapter 4 just to give you a little bit of background here. Uh, verses 14 through 18 of chapter 4. Look at what Paul says. Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church, no church entered into partnership. We're going to see here in a minute. Partnership means fellowship with me and giving and receiving except you only. At one time, there was the only brothers and sisters with them. <laughs> Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering and sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. Not only did they send gifts, they sent one of their members. They sent Epaphroditus to him. And we'll see, man, he sacrificed his life, almost cost him his life. Gospel ministry costs us our life because we, we die, we have to die to ourselves daily to follow Jesus, right? Remember Jesus' call? Take up your cross, that instrument of torture, and follow me. Yes. Deny yourself. Die to yourself. When? On Sunday? On Wednesday? No, daily. And as we were encouraged in Sunday school, to take God's word and to spend time with God so we know who God is. We know what his ways are. We know what his character is. We know that Jesus revealed himself to us to show us what the Father was like in character, in flesh and bone. That this is who we follow. Man, they joined him. Paul was then thankful. He was thankful. Being thankful in prayer leads to joy because it causes us to stop and reflect on the goodness and the graciousness of God. Yes. Amen. 
How do you begin your prayers is a question. That's not for you to share with everybody here. How do you forget, begin your prayers? I'll be honest with you. In almost 20 years, I've been in a lot of prayer meetings and many times it's, I need this or this, ah, ah, ah. It should begin with, I thank you, Lord, for your grace. I need you, Lord. I thank you, I praise you. Paul was demonstrating this. Jesus exhibited this perfectly in his life and submitting himself to the Father and his will as you look back at his righteous life. Paul was a prayer warrior. Three aspects of Paul's prayer that are jumping out to us this morning. Number one, you see it's frequency. The frequency of thanksgiving. Paul says, uh, always in every prayer, the KJV and the ESV says. This is an ongoing response to a deep friendship with the church. It, you need to understand that always, and look in the text in verse 4, always in every prayer of mine for you all making my prayer. Always does not mean unceasingly, but in this context, it's regular prayer. It's happening often. There's a, there's a habit going on. Paul is lifting up these believers continually, right? That takes intentionality. If we're going to love one another where we need to be thanking God and praying for one another daily. And we'll be getting you a membership role. And you're going to look at all the members of Bethlehem Baptist Church. And I'm going to encourage you and exhort us as a faith family to pray for one another. That's a lot of names. I've been going through it. It's a lot. And I've been going through it and learning these names and trying to put faces with names. So if I come up and I say, hey, buddy. I haven't got your name yet. <laughs> so please forgive me. I thought about, man, this would be this would be a, a crazy idea to get name tags and we all put name tags on. Because I'm sure there's people here you don't know, right? Just so we get to know one another, but we get that list so we can just be praying for one another. Right? We need to genuinely know one another if we want to love one another well. That's what Paul is saying. Do so you see the frequency? You see his focus. He prays regularly for who? Just to select few, the overseers and the deacons? Yeah. All of them. For all. Yes. Now, in any body of believers, there are some that are hard-headed. There are some of us that are not easy to love. It may be me, right? It may be you. But Paul doesn't make distinction here. He says, for all of you. Yes. Pray for all of you. The focus. He kept the Philippians, all of them, in his mind and his heart. So he prayed, prayed for each one of them as often as he could. But he was more than a general prayer warrior. Because if he was a personal prayer warrior. Who frequently brought all the members of the congregation and their needs before the Lord. That takes time, right? That's why we need to be intentional to write down these things. So I know I shared it this morning. You know, people are coming to hey, share that, pray for this and pray for this. I need to get time to write those things down. I've got to keep my little book in there so I write those down. I've got to be intentional to do that. I forget all the time. What happens is when we don't and someone tells us that we don't pray for them, or we don't mention, we begin to hurt people and think, you don't really care about me, right? And Paul was intentional. He was intentional to pray. And then thirdly, the joy with which he prayed. Even though, look at what he says. Always in every prayer of mine, for you all, making my prayer with joy. This is, there's joy. Joy and happiness are different. We'll talk about that here in a little bit. They're different. Happiness is fickle. We think and we are exhorted from TV right, to live our best life now. This world is our, you know, this, we're supposed to be happy and healthy and wealthy. That's a lie from hell. No, God's called us for holiness. Holiness. Amen. Where holiness is and godliness is where joy is. Because that's the pursuit of Christ. So even though the church of Philippi had many problems, and we'll see that as we walk through this together as a faith family, Paul, Paul was filled with joy as he thought about and reflected on the many good things that this church, would, that God was doing through them in ministering to them there at Philippi and to him. The, the grace note of joy reverberates. It reflects it. It's, it's like throwing a stone. You ever been in a pond early in the morning? You're going to fish. 
and upon it. Man, I love early mornings fishing or hunting or anything like that. It's quiet right about daybreak. Then you hear birds and squirrels and everything's going nuts and you can't ever hear a deer. <laughs> but you stand on the pond, you take a stone and you just skip it and you watch it and it ripples across that whole pond. Grace, joy, it's like a stone skipping across a pond in the early morning. Joy will show up throughout this book 14 times. 14 times Paul will share it. It's the primary emotion that he was dealing with. This was a real man in prison, but he had joy. Yeah. Circumstances didn't define it. His joy was in Christ. He felt it for these believers and it was reflected in his prayer. And this is the Christian life. The Christian life by definition is a life of joy. But often we as individuals are filled with grief and pain. However, we recognize in the midst of that pain and in the midst of that grief that there is a, a sovereign Lord, the sovereign hand of God working out his purposes in our lives, as he tells us in Romans 8, 28, he is causing all things to work together for our good, who are called according to his purpose, right? To all those who love God. He experienced sorrow when he reflected upon their problems, but rejoiced because God was in charge of even the painful areas of life. And he is, he is, he's good in those areas. He's good in the pain. He's good in the suffering. And we'll see that. I believe that's what he is calling them to reflect upon. That's what we'll see here as, as we move on. I don't want to jump ahead. It's been said that happiness is a response to circumstances. Joy is the confidence that is built on a relationship with Christ Jesus alone. Amen. Happiness is fickle. When things are good, we're happy. When things ain't, and I ain't making my plane, I'm not happy. Therefore, I'm not focused, right? And so what we try to do is, as, as a fallen sinners who've been saved by grace, saints in God's eyes now, but still struggling with sin, is we try to, we try to get happy, happy, happy. in our lives more money bigger house bigger car thicker carpet more toys more stuff we think will please us more relationships my wife is not pleasing me my husband not loving me like he should so we go elsewhere we step on people at work and try to move up the ladder to make more money We spend so much time trying to make money throughout our life. And at the end of the life, we try to use that money to try to give us more life in time. Both of which we it fails. Amen. How could Paul experience joy in the midst of being in prison and suffering and writing his letter? How could he do that? Notice the reason for his joy. Y'all ask great questions. Look at verse 5. Because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. How can he have joy? Because they have partnered together. When the gospel is at the center of your relationships in the church, you'll not only experience thanksgiving and joy, you will experience joy in your fellowship. Yes. This is what this word means. He uses a well-known word. We've already shared it. You've heard it before, right? Right? I'm not going to be sharing a whole bunch of Greek and stuff because I don't know a ton of it real well enough to be sharing. But the English captures it here. It's partnership. It's koinonia. It's fellowship. It's a deep-seated, a deep-rooted fellowship. But it also has this idea of sharing in an enterprise, sharing in a mission, sharing in a, a, a common vision. So Paul's rejoicing with these Philippian believers that he has entered and they have entered and partnered with him and proclaiming the gospel in an area where it's never been. <laughs> and he had the desire to go to Spain, right? We know that from Romans. Paul's wanting to take the gospel to the farthest reaches of the earth at that time that he knew. He wanted to go. He's going to take it. He's going to go. He's given financially. 
They were given, excuse me, financially. They were given prayerfully. They were encouraging. They sent Epaphroditus to encourage him. Carson is helpful here. What precisely does the word fellowship mean? And this is so good. This is why I share it with you. If you invite your neighbor to your home for a cup of coffee, that's friendship. If you invite your Christian neighbor, it is fellowship. There's a common bond within the body of Christ. If you attend a meeting at church and leave as soon as it's over, you've participated in a service. If you stay for coffee afterward, you have entered into some fellowship. Now, let me be clear what I'm not saying. This is not to guilt you if you have to leave here after the service and not stay and congregate and talk. But if the primary attitude is of your heart is to come here and get out of here as quick as you can, that is not fellowship. But it's a desire to meet with the brothers. And I know we all have things that we got to do when, when we get out of here, even on a Sunday. Right? Maybe be, be clear to not place a weight on you that's not here in the text. But what I'm sharing with you is fellowship. It's a desire to partner together, to talk together about a common vision. Let me see if I can illustrate for you. See, in, in the first century, this word had commercial ideas behind it, had a commercial understanding. Imagine old Bob and Bill. Uh, Bob and Bill, they, they come in together and they buy an industrial, industrial pressure washer. Okay? Hopefully this will, this will illustrate it. Uh, I've thought about doing that. I've got a buddy. He went to school, went to college, graduated, um, and he ended up opening up a, started pressure washing on the side. This is doing good. Kept getting a bigger and bigger pressure washer. That cat is killing it right now, financially. <laughs> like he is making a killing just pressure washing, right? But Bill and Bob come together. They buy a pressure washer and they start pressure washing business. They have entered into what is a partnership. A fellowship. In the New Testament, the word is often fellowship, pointed in, is tied to financial matters. You'll see it pop up other places in the New Testament. And so when these Macedonian believers, these Philippian believers, they send money to help the poor Christians in Jerusalem, they're entering into fellowship with them, a partnership with them. We see this in Romans 15, verse 26. See, the heart of fellowship, the heart of partnership is self-sacrificing conformity to a shared vision. Now, that's a mouthful, so let me say it again. The heart of true fellowship is self-sacrificing conformity to a shared vision. How, do we have, how, do we, how are we conformed to Christ? We're transformed by the renewing of our minds. That's why our gatherings are so important. Not just our gatherings, but your time alone with the Lord at home. Read, meditate, pray in the word. It shapes our mind. It changes our thinking. We begin to sacrifice selflessly. For what? A shared vision. What is our shared vision? The glory of God, enjoying him and making him known. Amen. By giving ourselves obediently to his commands, joyfully and obediently. We are now slaves of Christ, glad slaves to a king and a kingdom that is out of this world. Yes. That the benefits that we have now in Christ are out of this world. Your inheritance is rich. You don't have to worry about everything here anymore. What's coming so we can live free, not being shackled down by the chains of sin and the pleasures and the trappings of this world here and now. We can live for Christ. Because to die is gain. It's to be with Him and all the riches of glory. So for this little dash that we have that was shared this weekend at my father-in-law's celebration of life service, we got a born date and an end date. What are we doing in the dash? What's going on in the middle? Are we living gospel-centered lives that are centered in our relationships and seeking to honor God? Are we self-sacrificing and conforming to a shared vision. So we need to know what that vision is, right? Yes. Both Bob and Bill put their savings into the industrial industrial pressure washer. I come up with this, and I shouldn't use industrial. I'm struggling saying it. Industrial. There we are. They put their money into it. They put their savings into it. Now they share the vision. 
that put the shaky company on its feet. They got some skin in the game now. They put their money into it. They got that pressure washer. Now what they got to go do? They got to go get it done. They got to go clean, right? And then they're paid. And we're not working to get paid. We've been paid. Jesus paid yes. it in full. Amen. And our lives are his. And we want to glorify him with our lives. Christian fellowship then is, is self-sacrifice and conformity to the gospel. That's what fellowship is. That's what Paul has in his mind when he's writing because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day, from the birth of the church, back in Acts 16, where we spent a sermon on, from then till now, 10 years later, you've partnered. We've come together for a shared vision that the gospel is going to be proclaimed. Listen, that's what we're in. Yes. We're in a partnership together, you and me, and other local churches. That's why, that's why our churches, there should be differences, but there should be a lot of similarities as well. Number one, God's word is truth. It governs and shapes us as a people Amen. and the church. It is the standard. It is the rule. It is the measuring stick in which we order ourselves, our services, everything we do. But sadly enough, that's not the truth in most churches. They're totally radically different for people that only believe this is the word. That's why we must remain true to God's word. We must remain true to who Jesus is. Fully God, fully man. Amen. These, these truths are important. So we center on those things. Questions to think about this morning. What is your greatest joy? What gives you the greatest joy? Think about that. You answer that. My prayer this week has been the Holy Spirit would do that in me. He would reveal that to me more and more. And he would reveal that to you as my faith family. What gives you the greatest joy? Is it personal success? Is it some victory for your children or grandchildren? Hey, one thing I've learned about my mom and papa, you ain't got to get them to talk about our grandkids. You ain't got to ask them. Right? We're proud of our kids, man. You ain't got to get me to, to show you some video of time and get me playing football. You ain't got to tell me about, you know, hey, let me show you what Ellie Payne did. It's unbelievable. No, we love our kids. Does that, does that bring us joy? Yeah, that, that's a good joy. There's a lasting joy. Is it that acquisition of material things? John writes, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in truth. Paul reflects this attitude here in this passage. So where and how is your fellowship this morning? How is your fellowship? Are you experiencing thanksgiving and joy? Are you experiencing that? Are you experiencing true partnership and fellowship within the body of Christ? Not only that, when our relationships center on the good news of Jesus together, guess what? Verse 6, you'll experience the joy in your attitude towards others. Look at verse 6. Paul knew this, and, and here's, the, here's the, the rebar of this passage. Here's the foundation of this passage. I'm sure of this, that he, being Jesus, who began a good work in you, will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. What in the world is he talking about? What kind of good work is he talking about? He's talking about the fruit of salvation. When he caused you to be born again. When he opened your blinded eyes because of sin. And he opened them up and freed you from the God of this world to see him as beautiful. And your sin as nasty. And you deserving of wrath. And he quickened you and broke your heart and brought you to repentance and faith in Christ. This is the good work. And Paul says you didn't begin it. He began it. I'm sure of this. This one thing I know. This one thing we know, church. Christ has begun a good work in us. Amen. And he will complete it. He will finish what he starts. The title of the message. If you want a heading. He finishes what he starts. No. Yes. He, finished, he finishes what he begins. I got it in my notes somewhere. He finishes what he begins. He does. That's good news. That means he didn't give up on you. He has sealed us with the Spirit, and He's going to work. And as He works, you'll experience joy in your attitude, specifically toward other people. But it's all a work that He's done. Paul's confidence was in the Lord. He understood the Lord would finish it. Paul's joy in every situation was based on this confidence. This confidence in God. Right? Paul, you have the perfect storm of a man with a heart as big as Tennessee yes. and a theological understanding that was deeper than anybody in his day. 
He was born again and he knew God's word. He ate, drank, and slept the Old Testament. And he knew how to take the Old Testament and interpret it in light of the cross of Christ and the resurrection. So he would be able to tell people that Christ is all over the Old Testament. He fulfilled the law. He, the prophets were pointing to him. The priests, the sacrifice, all of these things. The kings, all these bad kings. And even some of the good ones who were all faulty men. King David, so good. That, that joker broke every one of the Ten Commandments with Bathsheba. Yeah. You go back and walk that, he broke every one of the Ten Commandments. And God says, he's a man after my own heart. How? Oh, I often thought that as a young man. How can David be a man after God's own heart? Psalm 51, he yeah. repented. Yes. Yeah. Amen. You want to be a man of God, a woman of God? Live a life of repentance. Yes. Recognize your need for God. Yes. Yes. And turn from your sin daily, knowing you're forgiven, you're free. The Lord, I want to be more like you. Paul understood these things. That's why in, in incredible adverse circumstances and sorrows could not deter the basic joy in which Paul approached life. He was a changed man deep within. Are you changed? Has the gospel changed your life? Yes, thank you, Lord. Not did I pray a prayer. Is he changing your life? Salvation is a point in time when you trust Jesus and salvation is a time, moments in time in which God conforms you. This is the process of sanctification. He's making you more and more like his son. That involves his good work by the spirit and what? Your obedience to his commands. And they're joyful and they're good. This is what he calls us to. I'm sure of this. That Jesus who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. When? At the day of Jesus Christ. Paul trusted in Christ. He knew that the final work of sanctification was glorification. And it would happen when Jesus busts the clouds and he returns. And the end of all things is done and we're with him forever. He's going to bring the past. But guess what? It ain't now. It ain't right now. Why? How do we know that? You talk pretty prophetically. How do you know, Zach? Because we're sitting and standing there. Yes. Right. So we got a work to do. And we keep the truth of where we're headed, wherever front. But even before that, it's not heaven we're after. It's Christ. Yes. It's Christ we're after. Amen. And in heaven, we're with Christ. And this is Paul's heart. This is Paul's heart. Our future is in his hands. He knew the future of those Philippian believers were in the, hell, in the hands of Christ. We fail only when we forget the reality and try to run our own lives and do things our own way. We fail many times yes. over and over and over when we take our eyes off the perfecter, the author and perfecter of our faith. Yes. For the joy, who the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Set your eyes on Jesus. Focus on Christ. Your attitudes will change. When God created the universe, he knew the fall would occur and he determined that he would have to personally enter into this world and pay the price for our sins so we could be redeemed. So the beginning of this world already awaited its end. And when redemption would be complete and evil would once and for all time be destroyed, this is what he's talking about at the day of Christ. Yes. The day of Christ Jesus. Yes. There is a consummation coming. There is a completion coming. Hey, listen. We all works in progress. Yes, amen. We are all his trophies of grace that he is forming and he is fashioning like a potter with clay in his hands. Making into something really, really pretty. I, I don't know anything about pottery. I like it, but I watch those people that get on those, put that play on that wheel and they sit there and next thing you know that thing's turned into some type of vase or cup or coffee cup that's pretty useful and then they put it in that oven they harden it that thing's just beautiful and it's, listen we look really messy right now the church looks really messy you're going through a lot of junk yes your mind has got all kind of junk going in it yep. god's going to work out for you right now. amen he's going to finish it He's going to make you more joyful as you submit to him. He's going to make you more thankful. He's going to give you lasting joy. He's going to change and shift your attitude in the way that you 
listen to him, look at him, look at others. He's doing that. Listen, when the gospel is centered your relationship, you, re, you experience a deep love and affection for others. A deep love and affection for others. Look at verse 7 and 8 when we close. It is right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart. For you're all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and the confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. He reminisces, he thinks back, and boy, he, he expresses his heart even more and more. It's right for me to feel this way. There's a deep-seated affection and joy every time he thought about them and he brought them up. This church, more than any other, as I've already stated, stood solidly with Paul. They endured. We tend to get upset every time Something little goes wrong. Not even we get upset ourselves. We get upset then at other people. And ultimately, sometimes, guess who we get mad at? <laughs> guess who we blame? God himself. Go back to the garden. The woman. You gave me. What? Adam blaming God? Yes. We do the same thing, man. We're fallen, broken sinners. Paul went to Jerusalem on the last trip after his third missionary journey. Wonderful plan to switch in ministry and headed to, to Spain, the western half of the Roman Empire. He wanted to complete his life's mission of taking the gospel to the Gentiles, to the farthest place. Many deserted him, the Philippians did. They partnered together. And you see this in the text. Look at what it says. I hold you in my heart. I hold you in my heart. There's a love, there's, a, there's a, a, a tenderness here that can only come through time, right? It comes through time and serving and partnering together. Paul identifies two areas in struggle. First, their gifts. They have shared in Paul's chains, the NIV would say. Bonds, the, the, the King James translation. Look at what it says, verse 7. It's right for me to feel this way about you, all because I hold you in heart for you. You are partakers of me with grace, both in my imprisonment. The, 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 the translation there captures the whole thing. Chains, bonds, imprisonment. They had, they had partnered together with him. And so they shared in Paul's defending and confirmation of the gospel, the proclamation of the truth. Paul relates all his success in verses 12 to 13. You see this as well. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to what? Advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my chains, my bonds, my imprisonment is for Christ. Man, he's focused. And he ends this, this section with thanksgiving again with another uh, emotional affirmation of his love for the church. Look at what he says in verse 8. For God is my witness. He calls God to, to be his witness now. Take the stand, Lord, how I yearn for you all the effect, with the affection of Christ Jesus. There's a deep love for these people. God is my witnesses. In fact, Paul's making an oath. Paul was swearing an oath in the presence of God to affirm his deep love for these, his brothers and sisters in Christ. He says that in, in chapter 4, verse 1, I believe. Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy, my crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. He wanted them to know that it was not just human feelings, although we have them and they're good, but they must be channeled. But the affection of Christ Jesus that was moving here. The word he uses here, he, he used a specific word, and it's, it's the word for, for bowels, or for figuratively to one's innermost feeling, not to get too uh, descriptive with kids in here. It's the inner part of yourself. When you've lost a loved one, or you've seen that loved one come home after a long trip, or served in the military, and your son or grandson or daughter comes home from war, and you see him come through that gate, 
or you stand over that casket for that last time, there is something that happens in your gut or you get that phone yeah. call. This is what he's talking about. Yes. Innermost feelings is moving him. His love for the Philippians was a reflection of Christ's love for them. There could not have been a deeper statement of Paul's love and fellowship. He couldn't have picked a better word. We don't pick it up as much in the English. But that's what he's saying. Do we have that kind of affection for one another? If we don't have that kind of affection for Jesus, and the good news, we won't have that for each other. Amen. We'll be sharp with our words. We'll be unforgiving. Our prayer life will be self-centered and not God-focused and thankful to Him. So God, we need you. We need you to change us and to make us. The word all here at the end appears three times in verse 7 and 8, showing that Paul didn't want to leave out any believer, including even those who were causing dissension. You're going to see this in chapter 2. He prayed for it. Who is that like? What does Jesus do on the cross? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing, right? Boy, do we have that kind of heart? Listen, gospel partnership, togetherness in the mission leads us. It leads to joy, and may we all labor together for the glory of Christ to be known and for the good of each other. Nothing can take our joy because Christ has begun a good work in us. Amen. And he who begun a good work in you, he will finish it. As men, I know in particular, speaking to you men, I like a man who shoots me straight and I want to know the bottom line of the bottom line. That's why I hate the one that car dealerships. Yeah. Like, like, uh, bottom line, that's low enough to go. Uh, well, I got to go. Well, you know, we can go a little bit. Like, hey, man, just tell me, what, tell me what you can do, right? We got any car salesman in here. I understand you're trying to make money, so I'm not mad at you. But I get frustrated with that. We want to know the bottom line. And the bottom line is this. Jesus is Lord. If he has saved you, he will sustain you. He saved you by grace. He keeps you by grace. And he's going to, by grace, take you home. He's going to finish that good work he started in the church. And he's going to pray that we partner together for the good of the gospel and the glory of God. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. I'd invite Jerry to come up and uh, have a song of invitation. Gracious Father, we thank you. And we praise you for your good work, Lord. We thank you that you will complete it one day. Thank you for the heart of the Apostle Paul and what he demonstrates to us in a life that is surrendered to you. Lord, may our thanksgiving and joy grow as we consider Christ. We consider, Lord, what you have called us to. So do have your way and do your work by your spirit for your glory amongst your people. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. She goes into surgery tomorrow. Um, so, uh, Pastor, if you would, close us. And thank you again. Thank you. We love you. Love you, church. Let's pray. Our kind and gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, as we've come into your presence today, thank you, Father, for the message, for the messenger. Lord God, I know that what we've heard today has come from you. 
I pray, Heavenly Father, for this church, Lord, as we work and labor together. Heavenly Father, God, you know our hearts, and we know that you're still working with us and through us. And I pray, Father, today, if there's someone under the sound of our voice today and you have spoken to them, we encourage them, oh God, to realize that we're all in the same boat. We were all sinners. We were all fallen and broken. And we needed your forgiveness and you have forgiveness. And Heavenly Father, even those that's not called upon you as yet, let them realize that you've already died for their sins. They just need to receive you and to believe in you. Father, we pray today, Lord, for uh, God, as we leave this place today, watch over us, lead God and direct us, help us to be used of you. Father, we pray today for Sister Judy and Brother Robbie. Lord God, be with her. Lord God, the surgeons. Lord, I pray for the, all the medical equipment that they that will be used. God, but most of all, behind it all, your healing virtue. Yes. God, we give you praise, glory, and honor. Thank you, Lord Jesus, today as we gather here. Now, Lord, as we come to the close of this service, continue to bless everyone as we depart. May we come back this evening, Lord God, to hear your word. We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.